Hey everyone, John P here. Today I'm gonna to be answering your questions that you've asked me over on my Instagram, The Real John P. From time to time, I do post a Q&A story where you can ask me quite literally anything and I will give you the answer straight up and direct. So make sure to go over there, Instagram, The Real John P. Before we jump into it, um, you know, we're gonna be talking about the best bang for buck Tudor watches. We're gonna be talking about so many great questions, a little bit of Rolex, some Omega, a little bit of something for everyone, so stay tuned. But on the wrist today, I have a two-tone Omega Seamaster Aquaterra in uh, about 36 uh, millimeters, kind of a replacement uh, or an alternative, if you will, to the Rolex Datejust 36. So pretty cool watch. I like this to my collection. I like to knock around with it sometimes. And of course, if we're talking watches, which we are, because that's what we talk about, do not forget to go over to delraywatch.com where we buy, sell, and trade. So many cool new watches that we've added to the inventory so make sure to check it out. Now the first question we're gonna jump right into, this person asks, what is Tudor's best current model for the price? Now this is gonna be an unpopular response, but I personally think that Tudor's getting a little advantageous and pushing the envelope with their pricing if we're talking retail prices. But luckily, you don't have to pay retail because the pre-owned market does exist and Tudor watches are floating out there pre-owned. I would say if you go get into the pre-owned space, the Tudor Black Bay, something like a Tudor Black Bay 36, the smaller, uh, you know, more in line with Rolex Explorer 1, um, alternative, if you will, from the sister brand, that seems to be a really great bang for buck watch doesn't have the demand like it does for the dive watches with that dive bezel. So I know that when we get them in the door, they go pretty quickly and we price them more than fair. So I think it's a lot of bang for buck because I see it from the collectors. Now the next question is what are the best watches for men? Now I'm not sure if this is kind of like a gotcha or a setup, right? You know, kind of implying, oh, there are some watches that are really just the best for men, but for women there's different watches and seems like kind of a kind of a setup here, but I always recommend to people to buy the watches that you enjoy and you're going to wear. There are way too many variables when it comes to starting to talk about maybe alternative investments and you know, profiting off your collection and putting a watch in the uh, in the safe. So even with my personal collecting, I like to have watches that I'm gonna wear. I think they should be worn. That's where I see um, an enthusiast like myself having the most fun with a watch, not just kind of dusting it off, looking at it, pulling it out of a box, throwing it back in and hope that a dealer pays me double someday. Boring for me, I like to wear them. So that's what I would say is the best watch for men or anyone really. Now this person asks, what would you say is the best bang for buck precious metal watch? And they specifically want a brand. Now precious metal is a little bit difficult because gold watches uh, in modern fetch ultra high premiums. And there are some examples with when you start getting into vintage where the, the gold versions are just super rare, um, certain Daytonas and the like, where that's gonna add a big premium, but largely older watches that are gold they don't retain the value like the stainless steel counterparts do. People tend to currently be gravitating towards stainless steel. So currently, if we're talking any type of watch, precious metal, bang for buck, I would look at vintage, smaller dress watches. I also think that Vacheron in precious metal seems to be a pretty good deal, especially if you want to go in the back catalog a couple generations back. These watches seem to be overlooked, something like a Vacheron uh, power reserve that uses a you know a JLC movement um, on the business end of this thing. I think that's a lot of great bang for buck. Precious metal, still getting a Vacheron name, uh, and seems to be underappreciated. Now, next, this person wants to know what is the best integrated bracelet watch under five thousand. Now, that's kind of a weird spot. I think currently for the integrated style, it seems like there's been a lot of push up in that segment and a lot of push down for the integrated Genta esque design, but I would say I have been thoroughly impressed with the uh, the Tissot PRX line, uh, kind of like the revitalization of the original PRX that was once a catalog piece, and now it's back and truly better than ever for, you know, truly in the 2000 and under, depending, I mean, they have different versions of the watch, different sizes, there's a quartz example, you get it, there's different things, so you can get a lot 
lower price than that, but the PRX seems to be doing things well outside of what would have been thought to be inside the price point. So I would look Tissot PRX. Next question, what are your favorite undervalued vintage watches? Well, this is kind of interesting because, and the vintage guys, and hey, myself included, I like vintage. It's interesting, it has a little bit of history, heritage. It kind of makes you feel like Indiana Jones in a way, right? I'm searching for that kind of treasure kind of feeling to it, right? It's, it's a bit of a hunt. I like that. But I will say that the auction houses and the run-up on prices of certain watch has just made certain vintage watches, most of them, overvalued. It has because they're starting to be looked at as more of collector's items and not watches anymore. They're looking at a place to park money as a speculation for some guy that doesn't know anything about watches, that saw um, you know, a big hammer price on a watch one time at an auction house and decides, yeah, you know, have their personal assistant put on a bid on some watch and hey, maybe they get it, maybe they don't, whatever. They've got other things to do. So I think, I do think a lot of vintage is overvalued, unfortunately, but I think there are some cool uh, brands that people can get into if they don't want to start playing in that ultra high-end space. I mean, I think something like an Enicar would be very cool. There's some uh, Universal Genève watches. Those have come down in pricing, uh, depending on the condition, but they've come down in pricing. So something like a uh, Universal Genève pole router, uh, they have a dive watch, a, a pole router sub, and and so many countless other watches for you to discover. So I would say, hey, these are places to start, but work your way from there, go on the forums, there's so many cool things to discover, and that's honestly what I like about Vintage the most, the discovery process. Why let me ruin it for you? Now, this next person wants to know about a safe way to clean bronze watches without ruining any of the gaskets and seals. Yeah, that's right, if you're gonna be using chemicals uh, even some of the chemicals that are used in cleaning certain pools or hot tubs and steam rooms, things like that, these things can wear and tear uh, on the seals, the gaskets. We're talking about, talking about rubber components depending on the watch. I mean, think about a flapper in, a, uh, in the water reservoir in a, a toilet, for example. That's rubber and it gets eroded with the, water, uh, the, the different chemicals that are in the water depending where you are in the world and so on and so forth. So, it wears down, it breaks down. But in general, I don't recommend using any chemicals on any watches. The cleaning thing, I think you can put a little soap and water if you want on it, if the water is water resistant, at least up to 50 meters. But I mean, let's just not get carried away with it. I personally have no problem wearing watches with dents, dings, scratches, a little bit of dirt here and there. But then again, I'm not digging in the mud with it. So I think water probably does the trick most of the time. A little bit of hot water goes a long way. Avoid the chemicals, and specifically with the bronze uh, or some of the other different metals, you know, they've used different uh, combinations of copper uh, and different alloys in the past. I would just let it age, you know, let it age gracefully. That's kind of what they're made for, but not all bronze ages, but it's kind of a dirtier metal if you look at it anyway. So I would just leave it as is. Um, that would be my take on that one. Now, the next question is, why have you stopped focusing on the strap company? Yep, um, oh, and over a year ago, we, I started Sinclair Straps. We were selling straps, and it was a lot of fun, but what I've noticed is it just wasn't the best use of my time, focusing more on Delray Watch, where just the time was producing more results for the time that I would spend on the straps. So I have handed off the strap, uh, the whole strap component to someone else. We'll see if anything uh, you know, interesting happens with that in the future. Uh, but I will say that truly, you know, with like Delray watch, it just made way more sense. Uh, also with the straps, so many people would ask endless amounts of questions with different references. Will this strap fit on this? And it just seemed very uh, labor intensive and the same amount of time and energy and focus spent elsewhere like on Delray watch was just yield yielding so much better results for customers and collectors and myself, it just made more sense and I was way more passionate about it. But thanks for asking. Now this person wants to know is, what is the best part of being in the watch industry? I mean, truly the best part is being able to, you know, essentially play with watches whenever. As just a collector before, and you know, before, much before Delray Watch, Delray Watch is, you know, seven years old at this point or thereabout. Before that, I would still trade and, you know, do some flipping and things on the forums. And that was kind of how I scratched my itch to be able to discover so many watches that I had never held before is you really have to buy them in a lot of cases, unless you're in a major city that has 
essentially pre-owned dealers. If you want to look at a back catalog watch, you just have to buy one and see if you like it and if you don't move on and flip it. So thankfully, I'm very blessed to have Delray Watch where I can kind of scratch my itch as a, uh, a really diehard enthusiast in that way and not have to always be you know, personally adding a watch to my collection and moving it on. So I like just that I get to work with watches every day. Very cool. Now, the next question, could I ever recommend Oris or are they more, is it more beneficial? They kind of word it in an interesting way, but is it, is it a better choice for them to go with Oris or Omega? I think that if you like the heritage more, you should go with Omega. But if you like getting a little bit more bang for buck, then probably Oris. You know, Oris watches generally are gonna be more approachable in price point than the Omega watches. With Omega, you are paying for them to pay the celebrities and things to endorse the watch brand. You're also paying for that heritage and you're paying more because they know they can charge it because they have that brand recognition. It's like paying for an iPhone versus paying for a Huawei. Not exactly, but you get the point. There's branding involved and that's really what it comes down to. Both of the watch brands make good watches, so don't have to worry about that. The choice comes down to you. Do you like the heritage or do you like a better bang for buck or maybe a model that Oris produces? The choice is yours. Let me know, Oris or Omega, in the comments below. Now this person wants to know, are there any watches that just make you laugh if someone asks for it? Actually, no. I mean, there, I can't think of a single watch that anyone has asked for that I just laughed because I think that snobbery in watches is something that has increased and it might be snobbery in general in the world or maybe the Western world or maybe the developed world, but there seems to be you know, groups of people that are just kind of like negative, right? They wanna tell other people that their choices are bad and their choices, their own choices are good. You know, I'm, I made the right choice, you made the bad choice. Admit you made the bad choice so I can feel better about my choice, with, which is the right choice. And I just think that's kind of weird, right? If someone likes something, let them like it. What do I care if they like it? If they're not bothering me, like it. And with watches, how could they be bothering me? What do you think? Leave that in the comments below. This person wants to know, will the recent watch dealer scandal hurt the watch industry? I'm not gonna say too much about it and I haven't been following a lot about it and I'm really just assuming what they're talking about but maybe in the comments below people will chime in. I don't wanna jump to conclusions because I'm really not following what everyone else is out there doing and we stay in our own lane at Delray Watch so I don't really have a lot to say more than the watch industry has always been you're as good as your last deal. That's how watches work. Old school industry that's become a little modernized, but it still has that core uh, kind of platform underneath it of a lot of handshake deals. When dealers trade, there's no contracts. Generally, sometimes there's some memo papers and things like that. A lot of handshake deals, a lot of trust, a lot of knowing who you're working with. Someone runs away a $50,000 watch, well, there's 50,000. How are you gonna get it back, right? So there's a lot of trust involved here. But that being said, the watch industry uh, and probably most industries have people that do things that are just not great, right? They're not good. People make bad decisions. If they didn't, the world would be perfect. We would live in la la land. But people make bad decisions in any industry, in any place, bad things happen. So always use your best judgment when choosing who to deal with in the watch space. Um, other than that, I think the watch industry is gonna be fine. It's hundreds of years old at this point. So um, I don't think you know one person could really take down an entire industry that's centuries old at this point. Next question. It seems like buying watches is hit or miss. Where are the worst places to buy watches today? Well, I'm certainly not gonna bash any competitor. And I mean, do I really need to say, oh, hey, go shop at Delray Watch, like whatever, right? But I would say, once again, like I, like I just mentioned, do your research on who you're dealing with. If something is too good to be true in life, let alone watches, why fall victim if you don't have to, right? Sometimes I see people, it's probably human nature, who knows, I'm not a psychologist, but people kind of get wrapped up in the what if, did I kind of find a loophole here? Did I get a deal that everyone else missed? Think of all the people in the world. Do you really think that you're the person that beat the system and no one else did? It's unrealistic, like, hey, maybe, but why take the risk? It's just the risk reward isn't really there. So always 
do a little research, use your best judgment, not just some judgment. Don't follow the herd, don't do what other people are doing. Looks can be deceiving. Um, and do your research on where you're buying a watch or even where you're selling a watch or who you're selling a watch to. It'll save you in the long run, maybe even the short run. Now, this last person actually, it seems like it's the same person, but it's a different spin on a question they ask. They wanna know, they just are new to watch collecting and they've noticed that there's a lot of judgment in watches. Is this normal or are they just new and it's not as prevalent as it seems? Yeah, I mean, there is some watch snobbery uh, and not everyone is a watch enthusiast. Some people buy watches because they wanna dangle them in other people's faces that maybe can't afford them. People wanna buy sometimes a Richard Mille watch and wear it on the floor of a Lakers game. People want to buy a 5711 and laugh at you because you don't have one. And that's just like a weird mindset. That's not someone that I consider to be necessarily truly part of the watch community. Maybe they kind of engage and leave a couple comments or talk or go to some meetings and meetups and some events and things. But generally, those are people that I know we don't work with at Delray Watch because we're focused on true enthusiasts not a lot of flashy stuff, a total different kind of segment of watches altogether. So yeah, those people exist, but I would say if you're new to watches and this is disheartening, there are plenty of communities and forums and threads and meetups where people just like watches, whether it's $1,000 or $20 or $20,000. For a lot of people that I know, they're good people and they don't really care about the egos. A couple of bad apples, but hey, what can you do? Try to keep positive and keep it moving. So guys, this has been me answering your questions that you've asked on my Instagram, The Real John P. Please do not forget to like and subscribe. I appreciate it. You can check out uh, Delroy Watch, where we buy, sell, trade watches. And we'll see you next time. You've been chatting with John P.